Well, welcome to season two of, well, perhaps Fuck You Friday. Perhaps it's FYF. I don't know. We can talk about that a little more uh, later. Uh, but I'm your host, Wynn Silverman. This is my co-host, Casey LeBlanc. Super excited here today. We have Coach Brennan of San Jose State. Um, there's some history here uh, that we'd like to go into. But, but Casey, I know this is the beginning of season two, and um, we do know the origins of things, and, and we're discussing, uh, like I said before, whether we're going to remain this brand of Fuck You Friday or Flip You Friday, whatever you want to do in the context of uh, sanctity, so to speak. Um, but with that, I, I wouldn't mind if just, just touch base with Coach Brennan, predominantly because we're anchored in San Jose State here, about the origin of, of Fuck You Friday and why we're here. And then I'd love to just shoot off and go. Well, we'll go from there. And, and thanks for coming, coach. This is obviously a near and dear guest to my heart. I played at San Jose <laughs> State and you're the head San Jose State football coach with a ton of success. The the origin of this, what, whatever the fuck we call it, actually. And by the time this is launched, we'll have a real name. But at I this point, we say fuck anymore. We've had to decide on whether or not the world is too crazy to put fuck in a title. So that's basically the origin of it. But San Jose State, is, you know, again, is, is a college that you coach for. It's where I played at. And we're just going to kind of jump right into that because where where this whole podcast came from was about kind of chip on your shoulder, working through adversity. And then the Friday aspect of it that I we talked about off camera was nobody's really competing on Friday. So kind of flipping that around and saying, you know what, instead of it being a third day of the weekend, how do we compete? How do we get better on those specific days? So uh, can you just start from that and what that like as soon as we say something like that, what is as a coach and a leader, where does that take your head? Well, it's funny because right now we're, we're in the, you know, off-season grinder phase. We finished spring ball about a month ago. And so the guys are just lifting, and the season is so far off. It's, it's like, you know, so Friday is a huge day for us. Friday is a day we're actually, um, you know, as we, get, as we get into, you know, we're about finished with this session of training, and the, uh, they have like a little bit of time off which the NCAA requires us to give them, right? Otherwise, coaches would be like, no, we're going to lift every they're, day they're, of the year. They're know? still around? The NCAA yeah. still around? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. And, uh, yeah, so so they, they they got finals coming up, and so that that's part of it. And then a little bit of time off. But when they come back in June, Friday is our day where the actual team lifts together. It's everybody together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, our thing there we talk a lot about is, is climbing the mountain. It's a great metaphor for us because we are uh, in the Mountain West Conference, and – you know, you don't climb a mountain in a single bound, right? Like that is a daily process. It's a total freaking grind. Every day you got to keep taking those steps. And Friday is a huge part of it because it's the only day of the week where we are actually all together. Um, there's not a lot of school going on right then. And, and it's not a fun part of it because you have to embrace that extra day, right? What you said, the third day of the weekend, you know, you don't get to take it that way, not if you're going to be really good. And so when you said that, I was like, I love it because that's how we have our off season set yeah. up for training that Friday is a big deal for us. So we, we, we may have, uh, we may need to sponsor as a, oh. as a, as a podcast, start getting into the sponsorship of San Jose state and make it a, make it a thing. So there we go. Well, no, it's really interesting coach. I, I want to know about the process of you. I, I've known you for, I mean, for many, many years as an assistant, now a head coach, it's <laughs> awesome to see you win, but uh, talk to me about how you got to be where you are now in terms of the process of getting hired at San Jose state and what was going through your head um, and, and even accepting that offer because it's an underdog offer, right? In a sense, no disrespect to San Jose State, but as a program, you knew that you're going to have to take on something. What was the process and went through your mind and decision making? You know, I think for me, I, I grew up in the Bay and, you know, I grew up going to San Jose State games. My dad played there in, in the late 60s. And so I, I got dragged to those games my whole life. And we always had great teams. Yeah. You know, you think about like when I was a kid in the 80s early nineties, like those were really good football teams. Right. And, um, then since then it's been just this up and down roller coaster. And, but, but the consistency they had of success, the NFL players, the championship teams, like all those, you know, a lot of those people. And so I always thought that this could be a really great place. Um, I was an assistant here from Oh six or excuse me, Oh five to 11. And during that time we did the same thing, right? We had a really good season and we're kind of in the middle and then we went down. Right. And then, and so, I had seen that cycle, and I always felt that if we could get the thing on good, stable financial ground, we could build a consistent winner there. We could build a champion there. We have an incredible school. We have an incredible location, which is the best thing. We got great weather, and then we got Silicon Valley, right? We had the, yeah. post, the best post-grad opportunity in the world for the kids to go to school there. And so how, how, did I, how could I connect those things? And that was where it started for me. Like, I thought we could win there. So for me, when I looked at it, I was excited as hell about getting the job. I'm like, we can go do this. We can go win this conference. We so there was never play. a concern. There was never, never a pause. Never, never. I was, I was so excited. I mean, even when the, uh, the athletic director called me, I interviewed on a Monday, 
And I flew to L.A. because I was still recruiting for Oregon State on, a, on Tuesday. And uh, I would check into my hotel. I went for a run because I was just stressing out. Sure. Right? I was like, oh, God, i got to burn some of this off before yeah. I have this visit tonight with the recruit. And uh, the AD called me. He called me and he's like, I want to offer you this job. And I said loud, like, holy shit. <laughs> like, I was jacked. Like, I was fired up, right? And so then, you know, the process started for us trying to build it. So you, one of the things they talk about in a, in a great book, it's called Good to Great, is the hardest part is starting the flywheel, right? Once yeah. you have, once it's started, it's kind of easier to build momentum, but getting it from zero to one is one of the most difficult spots. So you get to San Jose State, and I think it's really important to talk about, you take a, a program that is a smaller program in, in Division One. how do you get momentum? How do you start? What, what type of things are you thinking in your head as you try to strategize on how I'm going to make this a winner? So part of it, I, I think, was because it helped that I'd been an assistant there. And so I had some background, right? Like I had seen great players like you come through there. I'd, when I was there as an assistant, I, I coached James Jones yeah. and John Broussard and Adam Trafalis played for us. And, like, you know, we had good players. And, and so I thought we could attract talent. I, thought, I didn't think that would be a problem. But the biggest thing that I thought, and I, and I thought that, like, even San Jose State on the whole, you and I spoke about it earlier, was that I felt like at times the school just doesn't represent itself in terms of, like, how successful – it is putting really great yeah. people out into the community. Like, I just think that's, a, that's missing. And I felt like that was part of it was attached to the football program. So we, we focused right away on, like, telling our story. And so we got really creative in, like, the social media space and putting out great content and telling the story of these young people that were going through this process of trying to build this program. And it became a lot of human interest, and it became – it generated a lot of excitement, and it, it eventually changed some perception, right? And so then all of a sudden we're involved with recruits at – high-profile high schools that they, they, they wouldn't talk to us before. Or we're getting kids on campus to come take a look. And, and when they get around the staff and they, and they find out, like, hey, these are good guys. Like, I can do this here. My family can watch me play. Uh, it's a great place to go to school and get an education. And then, like, you know, I can start working. You know, I can intern at Google in the summer can, or Adobe. Can you, can you give me an example of – I feel like – I mean, this, that's all great, amazing stuff, right? And it's exciting. Um, there's a lot of winning involved right now. But can you give me an example of – because I think this is where winners are made. Uh, adversity is there. Is there a moment in your oh. career as a head coach, like uh, just one? So many. Yeah, it but I want to so know that and many. how you how you oh defeated it. Like, give oh me give God. me an example. So I um, like I have two that like are stick out in my mind. Okay, so we we were playing Hawaii. Um, it's our it's our third game. It's pretty early in the season, and we go to five overtimes. And we have this awesome kid who's a kicker, and he has a tough day, and he misses a couple kicks. How, 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 how many years have you been at San Jose at this point? It's my second year. Okay, so first year. So first year we were not good. We're just, right. like, trying to build it. That second year we weren't – we were better, right? So the second year we played – we had six games where we were tied leading or one possession down in the fourth quarter. So I'm like, hey, there's progress here. It's just not wins and losses. But, like, yeah. these, we're not getting blown out at halftime, right? Yeah. And so we're at five overtimes with Hawaii. And going in the fourth overtime we're on offense second and we stop them. And we miss a, I think it's a 23-yarder, which is almost a PAT <laughs> to win it, right? And so this moment where after I go talk to the media, and I'm just annihilated. And the head coach <laughs> from Hawaii was my good friend, Nick Rolovich. And I'm just oh, like, yeah. just really wanted to. Good quarterback at the Sabercats, right? Yeah, I really wanted to beat him, you know. And, 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 <laughs> and uh, just all of it. I just wanted it for our team to feel that win. And so I was in the, I, I'm done with the media. I go in the locker room, and I shower. And I'm by myself, and I'm like, Squat down, and I just start bawling Ugh. hard, yeah, hard, right? And, you know, finally I get my shit together, and I go back out, and, you know, I see my wife, and I see my brother, and, and my family, and my kids. And, like, at that moment, I was like, I just need to make a decision, right? Like, if, if, if we're going to be better, I have to be better. And that started, like, the real path of, or real, like, change for me, like, in terms of how I approach my day-to-day, -day, uh, my routine, my thought process, and, and it became more of a, like, what do you want to choose to believe, right? Do you want to choose to believe you can or choose to believe you can't or we can't, right? And that's what I just started talking with the team about, right? And that's where we started talking about climbing the mountain, right? Like, yeah, it sucks today, but, like, we got to take another step. Like, it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't matter, right? Just the, the, the grind of it. So and, I want to hear the other story, but I think this is a really important point that we went by really quickly is one is you just make a fucking decision. Like, right. you make at that moment in time, 
you're like, I don't want this to continue. I need to, like, you're committed. You make, you got the job, you, you know, you, you have your first season, you're right in the middle of your second season. So now it's like, I need, I need to do some things differently, right? Like, no, it's no longer just the players. Yep. It's not the, the facilities. Yep. There's a lot of times in our lives where we could just go, you know what? There's a lot of outside things that yep. I can't control that a lot of yep. people will easily blame. Yep. And you at that moment just said, no, fuck that. This is on me. Yeah. The 23 yard that should go, but Ultimately, like I'm the head coach, I take yep. the responsibility. I need to, I need to make the change. So, yep. when you made that decision, you talked about your mindset. What are some of the other things that 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 you remember in that moment, making the the thing to say, "I decide to be different." Dude, so so you're right on, and and I would say a problem with it for me was it it, it wasn't until I got through the end of the season mm. where I really was able to like full go like full throttle on that, like where I could not make that decision. Right, like so. I, so I went through Christmas, like Christmas break. Right, we go through recruiting, Christmas break. You know, it's we're home for Christmas, and I'm just being a baby, feeling <laughs> sorry for myself. I'm doing all the stuff I I ask the players not to do. Right, I'm making excuses. I'm just like I'm just like I'm this awful version of myself. And so January sixth, two thousand nineteen, like for some reason, you know, we were still on break, and I was like, it, th that day, I said, this is the day. It's really weird. You said make a effing decision, right? I'm not using the F word because my mom might hear this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, she's coming tonight to the event. But, oh, uh, good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so I I made that decision, and what it became was like um, heavy dive into like a lot of like self help podcast meditation. I had built a routine, journaling, affirmations, like, and so it's a, it's something that I do every day now, and it's been I don't I don't know three years of that um, where that's that's how I start my day because again I said. If we're going to be a better program, I have to be a better version of myself. That, like the, whoever I've is, been, that is truly, literally the the practice of good habits is virtue. You're being virtuous. But that's I mean, not but changing you as a coach. That's changing you as a person. As yeah, a person, no question. question. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. like, you're not saying I need to like draw up better plays. No. Right. You're saying the core, yeah. which I've had a level of success, worked your way all the way up to be a head coach. How many head coaches are there in Division One? 131. 131. I'm one of 131. <laughs> right. Yeah. I get paid a good amount of money. I'm in the, right. my hometown. I've got yeah. a great, great family and kids, but, and I still want to be better. Right? right. So I'm already the elite of the elite of the elite, but it's not good enough. Right. For what you yeah. expect of yourself. So yeah. how did that impact everything? It, it, it changed everything because really like this for any coach. And I, and I really think for any leader, if you're doing it right, it's not about you. It's about the people you serve. Wow. And was I doing a good job serving these young men, right? These parents trust me with their kids. Um, these coaches on our staff trusted me to be worth a damn, you know, and, and I just, the, when I stopped like, complaining and making excuses and that, just that victimhood bullshit that holds so many people down. Um, and, and I've been telling my kids that their whole life, you know, like that's an ongoing joke with my children and I like fair or unfair. I'm like, the world's full of miserable people that blame their misfortunes on somebody else. Sure. Right. I tell my, I've been telling my kids that since probably they were too young and I didn't tell it to them so nicely. Right. And, and I was doing that. So I was like, what the hell's wrong with you? Like, you're asking this to the people that you coach. You're asking this to the people that work with you. And you, you need to flip it. And after that, it just became a simple choice. Like, what do I want to choose yeah. to believe? And it's I, such and a I'm good like, point. I, I just it, chose it, to believe it, we can. It's it, such a good point. I just, I, I, we, we could talk about this for three hours, right? Mm -hmm. It just is right up my alley. So uh, take us through then. So you make the decision. You start doing the practice. What? I love the point of like, look, this isn't about me. It started with me. I made the decision. Then I started implementing it. But how does, how do you get to, because you actually oversee hundreds of people, right? If not, right. if not thousands with alumni and it's not just players, right? Okay. Head coach, the, the job is, is massive, but how do you start to actually influence change amongst others? So you've made the change, you've made the decision, right. but the real impact in life could be made when you start to influence others. And then this whole momentum thing can be, can be obtained. Right. So, so really we just like, I started talking with our staff about that. Right. I, I gave them this, um, I, I made this PowerPoint and I said, you know, one year from now we will be these things. And, um, and I revisited every year and it says 2019, you know, mm. and, uh, and it's interesting because in a short time, a lot of those things have happened. And, and I think lots of times is, is, I mean, as adults, like all of us, we, we go through life without like any clear target, right? Like that was part of my like daily, like kind of affirmation or my daily, like what, what am I going to get done today? Or what am I trying to get done in a year, five years, three years, whatever. 
it was, I, for so long, I didn't have any, like, there was no bullseye. It was like just going, you know? And once I drilled down on that a little bit and made it specific, it became much more easier for us to get there. And we, and, and then in terms of the influence, I just didn't let people bitch. I just said, stop. Yeah. Just stop. Great. Like, like in our building, like, okay, how do we like, how do we feed the players better? How do we give them more gear? How do we give them better training? How do we give them better coaching? How do we teach better? How do we communicate better? Um, how do we tell our story better? Just, and just like kept talking about that and just, and, and there was resistance at, at, at first because yeah, because people don't, naturally do that right they're just not people i mean sadly are just not naturally optimistic because they learn from people that are not naturally optimistic right. Right? right and there's this yeah. whole yeah. yeah it's hard to change that yeah. momentum yep and the and i would say the other thing that's different with the generation that we're coaching now is that the outside influence of social media that when they <laughs> don't play well right like ten thousand people might go on twitter and be like dude right, you yeah. suck yeah. yeah right like so if they're saying that to me at the time as a 45 year old man I'm like, whatever. Like, I'm not giving my power away to some dude on Twitter that, right. that I don't know. But you're in control but, of your emotion. You have yeah, perspective. Yeah, but the kids don't, right? right. Or, or the young men yeah, don't, they're right? 18. They're 18 years yeah. old, 20 years old. And so they feel that. And so trying to help them deal with that too. And just like, hey, like, let's not give our power away to people we don't respect. Let's trust the people in this room. We're the only ones that believe we can. Yeah. So let, let's us encourage and empower each other. So, so speaking of empowerment, let's come back full circle to you crying in the shower. You said oh, that's that brutal. You, well, you said that there was, there was two, I, 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 I love this. So I want to hear just, the, you, just you, there was two moments in your life, uh, in your coaching career at San Jose State where you had this moment of adversity. What, what was your second? So the second one was that, that Christmas break where, mm. where like right after that season where I was just feeling sorry for myself and I let it go and I kept pushing. I just like, I was, it was pathetic. It, it controlled you. It, it controlled I, you. I, there's no question. As yeah. I look back on it, it was absolutely pathetic. Like I'm embarrassed of who I was that month of December in 2018. And that right after that New Year's there, that's when I started like that was the diving decision. into it. And I was like, January 6, 2019. Let's, awesome. let's, okay. let's talk because because Wynn and I talked about this and I think it's really important is this idea of the generation that we're in yeah. and the impact of a lot of negativity, the social media. And then we just had covid and then maybe some or some people do not know about this NIL deal where the college sports and the and the the human at 18 to 22 right now is just well, being influenced. They're being pulled yeah, by a lot of different let's things. Let's categorize so, this in the context of recruiting because I think it captures it. Well, or, yeah, I think recruiting, but also just leading young men, yeah, right? Recruiting right. and leading young right. men. So just kind of walk us through. We're curious. Uh, I'm sure other people are. Is like, what's the state of the yeah. young adult, specifically men, just like, cause I think they're athletes, but yeah. what's the state of the young adult right now? And how are you, how do you have to change Man yourself and the way you're leading yeah. and the, the way that the world is? That's a really good question because yeah. I, so, so we have a good, we have a sports psych team that's been working with us and uh, it's been a couple different people and they've been fantastic uh, on our journey. But um, one of the conversations we had in fall of 2018 was they were talking about uh, how this generation and, you know, through all the stuff, they're like studying all the, like the psychology and by the way, San Jose state was fundamental in sports psychology. Tutko, I think was the, was the founder of sports psychology in San Jose state. Another, another Where ribbon. Harry Edwards, state. Dr. Or Harry Edwards. Yeah. yeah. So but, I'm sorry. Yeah. I started. It's no, just, no, you're good. I mean, and I think that, that, you know, young people, what they were telling us was that the people we're coaching right now have like the social and emotional intelligence of, of people that are like 11 to 13 years old. So because of, all their interaction is on the phone, right? Like it's all digital. There's no emotion. There's no body language. There's no facial expression. So they, they're talked about like, they might not understand when you're upset because somebody yeah. like runs the wrong route or, you know, blows a gap they on can't the defense. They, they, they don't see that. They don't understand those normal social cues that, that <laughs> we grew up understanding. And so that changed how I approached it. I became much more positive, mm -hmm. right? Uh, much more like uh, from the mindset of like a, like a little league coach. Right. Like, wow. you know, in, in, in that part of it. And, yeah. and we had more fun. Yeah. yeah. We had more fun. I wasn't we're, pissed off. One all of the time. guys. Yeah. 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 We're like high five. I know. I've seen you. I've been around campus with yeah. you and you, you, you're high five. And <laughs> you, I mean, aside from a lot of his gray hair, you wouldn't know he's not one of the players. <laughs> Is that gray or white? Yeah. I can't, no, okay. Coming, no, I have, I have an important question that I want to ask fast. in, in light of that and in the spirit of you as a coach. And, and also the other thing is because you can't say the F word cause your mom might listen, but what are the things that you look for in a kid that, you know, a kid that you're either recruiting or is on the team that is going to drive true leadership that you would want. You want, you know, because it's, I, I, I want to let you answer. And then I have my own, I'm all opine on what I think <laughs> that, <laughs> oh, that I, that's a good word for it's you. It's a San Jose state education, yeah, sir. So. Yeah. Okay. This has got a big vocabulary here. Yes. Right? I'm trying to keep up as a UCLA grad, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, they, um, okay. So 
when we're recruiting, we ch- after our first year, like our first year was tricky because we had a really tight window to sign a recruiting class because we got hired late and I wasn't able to hire staff till a month later and it was really tricky. Um, so our next year going into it, we said, look, we are going to make sure that we can say a kid is tough, he's smart, and loves football. Now, now he has to have enough talent, whatever, baseline. He's got to be able to run fast enough or be big enough to hold the B gap or whatever, you know, right? There has to be some of that. But if they don't love football, they're going to not enjoy college football. It's just no. too hard. And so what we've seen is that a lot of young people, they like getting recruited. They like how that feels because it's a ton of attention on Twitter, right? Like, you know, some of the kids, when I was coaching Oregon State and we recruited a little more nationally, like some of these kids were getting, you know, they get offered by a Nebraska and all of a sudden 15,000 people would follow them, right? Like, and you're like, whoa. Yeah. Like, and so the kids felt that. And so that felt good. And so trying to figure out, and that happens at a lot of, a lot of like high profile schools, right? Where the fan base is rabid. It doesn't matter where you are, right? USC or UCLA or Washington or Oregon or whatever, right? But, um, so we're trying to figure out in terms of the leadership piece, who is not infatuated with being recruited, right? We want to know the, the football guys who are going to be the grinders and who are going to like attack, you know, F you Friday, you know, and, <laughs> and, and that part of it. And so the, I, I really believe that leadership shows up early and those guys, that if they're leaders on their high school team, they're going to have a chance to be a leadership in your building. Um, but finding out about that when you go and visit them, like it's really often if I was recruiting you and I was walking across, you know, Bellarmine's campus, like I would, I would, if I saw somebody and they would see the logo, kids always ask, Hey coach, who are you here to see? Actually, if you were, I would, I would walk up to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You would know who I was, whether you knew uh, walking me, walking by, I used to go up to every college coach that was on yeah, campus or, or, and I'm or, like, Hey, I'm going to play. These days you'd limp up to him, but yeah, you're right. Smart. But most kids don't do that now because they're not used to that face-to-face communication, sure. right? They're sure. right. and shaking someone's hand. They're used to having all their communication on, on, you know, on their phones. And so those guys, when, when we're do- doing that and going to find out, I'll ask other kids. Hey, I'm here to see Casey LeBlanc. Tell me about him. Oh, and they'll be like, oh he's wow. a good dude. You know yeah. what I mean? Or everyone on campus likes him, right? Or I'll, you know, if I'm checking in the front office and the secretary's there, I'm like, you know, hey, I'm here to see Coach So and So. Yeah. Um, but hey, tell me about Casey LeBlanc. Yeah. Like, does the secretary in the front office know the recruit that I'm coming to see? That's awesome. Like, what kind of influence does that kid have on campus? Right. Right. Is what I'm trying to find out when we're there, and our, co- and our all of our coaches do it. It's really positive. So you recruit what? If you get a college scholarship. Um, especially in division one, there's a lot of leadership at the high school level. Mm -hmm. Now you move into college, you become a smaller fish at a bigger pond, right? Now you have, let's just call it a hundred guys on your team. Right. And you get to pick guy, four guys that are captains, right? Somewhere around that number. So there's 4% that are the things that you're looking for that when you're not in the building, you're not in the room, you're not at the party, you're not on the social media hundred percent of the time. Let's talk about those four and who, how you decide and what you're looking for in those four, because I'd imagine Oh, there's a hundred guys that are all leaders that are, you know, you're offering a scholarship to a lot of those guys and they're all going to perform really well in high school, but there's a transition that happens. And now, now, now you're in college. But I think, you know, the answer to this question, like to me, that naturally separates, it separates by the work. It separates by how they interact with people. It separates how they, by how they lift people up or tear people down. Like some people, you might have a badass player, but you know, if he blows everybody up and he's screaming at people and, but what, what, like, what's your role as a coach, though? Do you embrace? Uh, do you see the ability to coach as the ability to influence and shape an individual, and as from a freshman developing into what you want him to be by being a by senior year, for example? So is, is that is, you have that you effect ask, on people? Are you asking his leadership? Are you is it? Are you born with it, or is it learned? Yeah, I mean, I mean so, in a way, in that, in in a that way, re- you know, I I think every coach or every coaching staff like has some sort of level of influence on the player, and and, and what is important at your place, right? Mm-hmm. You know, for us, like respect is a big thing. And with the generation we're coaching, it's a really interesting thing because they're the first to not want to be disrespected. Like that's a big deal yeah. to get disrespected. But then at times they also have trouble like showing respect. Mm. And I'm like, hey, that doesn't work that way. Like <laughs> if you want to get respect, you have to give respect. And so mm. trying to help them understand that. But in, in terms of as the leadership starts to separate itself, um, it I've seen it both ways, right? Like players will follow guys that are good players on the field, like there's a natural respect that comes sure. with like that dude is a dog yeah. and, I, and I wanna and I wanna rock with him. But then there's also the flip side of that where that guy's really not capable to lead the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And you know that as a head coach. When it comes to choosing our captains, I let the team vote. 
Mm. I was just going to say, I, I think as a team, you you implicit as a player, you implicitly know who you those do. people are. You do. I, I don't know if it was your, that was your experience, but you did you implicitly in, in, know? Not even just in football. That translates in life. In, in, in life. Into, into That's life. what I said. You answering your own question. But the, but <laughs> there is a, there is a part of leadership that is learned, right? And in, in, yeah. and so maybe there's some inherent qualities that you're born with. But sometimes they're just they just never manifest. They're yeah. not developed. It's not something that you learn or right. care about or know about. Yeah. Like and so as a as a coach, as a leader, it's identifying the people that have the potential on several yeah. like not just physically, emotionally, mentally. Like there's a lot of things that yeah. go into leading young men. And I, I just I'm, I'm we're fascinated by it from a, like how you develop and yeah. gain yeah. and grow um, confidence into leadership and so forth. So. We talked about the 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 moment when you were shook, right? And in your in your coaching career, I believe that confidence that is is a momentum game. And I'm curious how you you coach that and how you identify it and how you bring out the best version of each one of your players. And is it something that you guys as a coaching staff work on, or is that just something that you guys kind of take uh, for granted? Uh, no, no, we talk about that all the time, okay. you know, and, but I do think there are some things that are fundamental to that. And I think it would probably say, you'd probably say it translates to business too. Confidence to me comes from preparation, being ready for the moment, right? Whether you make the play or not in that moment, if you were as prepared as you could possibly be, Dude, I mean, maybe that dude over there is Reggie Bush, and he's just hard to tackle. Give me some examples. You know Give like, me some examples from from your perspective when you're coaching. Like that, a lot of people say that, right? But then, like, what do you mean? Because preparation is absolutely true. But tell me how what you mean by preparation in the in the context of college so football. It, so, like at our place, a lot we talk about extra because I think even Fu Friday, what you're talking about in the context of that is doing work when no one else is. Right. Everybody works Monday through Thursday, Monday, some variation of Monday through Friday. Like it's the same thing with football teams, right? Every team can lift for two hours a day, eight hours a week in the off season. Like it's not different at yeah. USC yeah. or at, you know, Sac State. It doesn't change, right? Like every school has the same rules. And so if you're always doing what everyone else is doing, how are we going to climb the mountain? Like how are we going to make a jump if we do the same thing that everybody else is doing? So to me, it comes down to the extra and the extra is in different places, right? It's in the weight room. It's pre it's prehab, not rehab, right? Yeah. It's we talked it's, about that in life right now, right? Yeah. Like taking care of your body. Yeah, no question. Um, That's and, great. and the distinction between, you know, physicians and everything we went there. It's very, what, what easy, are, it's easy to define as extra, right? Yeah. Like, like, like to me, I'm like, I met with the team today. I'm like, just right now, just ask yourself, what extra are you doing? Hmm. What extra, like, are you getting 10 minutes with your coach? Walk by his office. Hey coach, can we watch? this or hey coach teach me something right like, it's so easy it's not hard and i'm not asking for three hours i'm saying can you find on moment. your time on your clock not on the clock that we define or that the ncaa defines can you find extra in your day they all have ipads right dude we all your plays are cut up watch your plays from the season watch our opponent like who gave you fits last year you're a corner you got to cover this dude he's a savage Watch him again. What did he do to you? How did he get you in the game we played? Where are you finding extra in your day to day? And that's what this is about, isn't it? What what yeah. what are, yeah. what do you do that's extra? Tell us about you personally as a coach, as a as a dad, as a um, a husband, as, as a, a leader. son, as a as a brother. Well, how are what are what are some of the things that people can glean? No matter if they understand college football, being a coach or not, like to, you, you're obviously elite. So what are the what's your extra? My my extra is people. Like I I love people. Right. So. You know, um, I pick up the phone. People call me. I'm not hard to get a hold of. I'm not hard to find. I show up for people. Um, I show up for people on campus. Like, like I want our players to do that, right? Like, I think one of the stigma of football players is that they're, you know, they're whatever. They're meatheads or yeah, they think they're sure. so sweet or they think they're too cool. Like, I don't want us to be that cool guy. Like, like we go support the other teams. We go watch the softball team or the tennis team or, you know, the water polo team. Like, we need to show up for people. And so, for me – Showing up for people, that's my extra, right? Show up for my players, right? Like some guys didn't have a place to go on Easter. They come with me and my family's Easter egg hunt and then watch the yeah. little kids go nuts. Like that's awesome. Like just but so that's where I I put my extra um, with our players. Players call me all hours of the day. It's fine. I pick up. If I don't pick up, my wife yeah. wakes me up and puts me on the phone. <laughs> She's like, "Hey, so and so is calling you." Um, but that that's that's where I put it for me. Um, that's that's my strong suit. So it's maybe a little bit of an easy lean. But it sure as hell isn't always convenient. I like the idea of leaning into things that you're good at, you're comfortable with, and then accelerating those, using them as a competitive advantage. Now, 
I think when, when, when we talk about being elite and the extra and a lot of these other things, what are, what are ways, how do you balance it? Because you, you're, you're married, you have kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, t- let's talk about how, and, and you just, you just mentioned you're extra as people. So you give a lot from the answering of the phone to showing up to events. So you're spread in a lot of different areas. So how do you balance that in your life? So you still get to take care of yourself and the people yeah. that are really important uh, to you. So in terms of like taking care of myself, like I'm just an early morning guy. I wake up at 5, 15, 5, 30 in the morning every day. And I like do my stuff early before the day gets nuts. Um, once my office hits 7 a.m., there's probably someone walking in my office like, hey, I need this or I need to talk to you this or you got to go do this, which, which is fine. Um, I would say the biggest sacrifice comes on my family side. Like I have this wife. She's incredible. She's super tough. Um, she's independent as hell. Um, you know, so that part, she's the magic in our thing. There's no question about it. She's a fantastic mom. Um, I've got three great kids. Since I've become a head coach, I'm a little bit, it's, I can dictate the schedule, right? Like the, the, you know, I would say my biggest regret of the path I've chosen is that I missed a lot from, you know, when I was an assistant coach, right? Sure, just, recruiting and, just, just, and yeah, traveling. Time, time away, yeah, right. time away, time in the office, you know, it depends <laughs> on who you're working for. Sometimes, you know, you sleep in the office, you know, and it depends on what the workload is yeah. or, or what has been put on you. And so that part of it, um, they, they bore the brunt of that, I would say. Um, now, I don't want that to happen to my coaches, right? We're, you're talking about what kind of environment are you creating for the people here that work with you and share this experience with you. That's my responsibility, right? The people that have chosen to stay with me and ride or die with me, what kind of work balance, life balance am I giving them? Can they still be husbands? Can they still be fathers? Their kid has a little league game. Can they go? Right? Like, that's what I want them to do. So, like, that's where, um, since I've been a head coach the last five years, right, I've, I've been there. I've watched my kids play field hockey and basketball yeah, and great. soccer, and it's great. Yeah. yeah. And I want our coach to do the same. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I want to pivot just a little bit, um, and, and I want to place myself. If I, was, if I was a senior in high school and I was, a, you know, an elite football player, um, I've maybe received some accolades, but it's literally now. And we've gone through, we've gone, just like we've spoken, we've gone through a, a pandemic. We've gone through COVID. Um, we've gone through major changes in the NCAA with NILs, um, and, and everything that comes along with that. If I'm sitting here as a, as a, as a recruit who is an athletic elite athlete and I'm not being recruited, are there reasons why now, whereas before maybe there wouldn't have been? I think, um, you know, I do think that most of the time we find people, but I also think frequently people make mistakes. You know, I, I think, you know, I tell recruits that a lot. I tell high school coaches or parents, you know, um, when you look at the NFL, yeah. right, how much money they spend on evaluation and process yeah. and, and how many times they're just like, you know, off and how many times they're on. Like you yeah. look at those rosters, right? Those rosters are made up from players from all over the place. It's not, they don't all come from, you know, Ohio State or whatever, yeah. right? Like they're from schools all over the country, Division Three, Two, One, One Double A, all that good stuff. So, um, you know, I, I think I do think it is. There are more eyes on you than there have mm-hmm. ever been, mm-hmm. and for sometimes the reason might be simple. Um, even though you might have a lot of accolades, it might be a a physical component, right? Doesn't run fast enough, you know, not yeah. not big enough, doesn't project well, is not doesn't look like he changes direction well enough. I think there's some of that, um, and then I, I would say like if you're trying to be that. Like, you need to have your stuff in order. Like, you need to get good grades. You need to be a good dude, right? Like, when we come on your campus and, you know, the— Show the, up. Yeah, yeah. Someone, <laughs> someone, someone, people need to believe in you. They need yeah. to think you're worth yeah. the investment we're about to make uh, just as an institution financially, but also in man hours in, in terms of what we're about but, to but pour how, into you. How has COVID affected this and the, and well, the transfer hard. portal and all that? I yeah. mean, you know, I don't know how much you want to speak to it, but there's got to be— there's, It's hard. I mean, it, it, there's this, it's, we've never been in a situation where no there's doubt. kids that have been granted, what, six years, seven yeah. years? What's going on? So, and, and I would say this year and last year, the two hardest years to get recruited in the history of college football because all these kids were granted an extra year. And so— uh, you know, in 2000, in 2021, they gave you, you were allowed to go over your scholarship allotment. To yeah, 110. Yeah, that's so, why the, so, that's so the, you're able to, you could have pushed it all the way. Yeah. But yeah. 25 over, right? Wow. Like a full class. But um, then they brought it back down to 85 this year. Uh-huh. Right. So it, you were kind of stuck with some roster spots and some roster management became really complicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, at, at that time you had COVID, you had the super seniors, you had transfer portal, and then you had NIL, right? So you have, and without a lot of regulation, so yeah. it's, it's super complicated. And um, you know, you went from not being able to buy a player a burger 
to now be able to buy a player a burger joint. Like, you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, you can yeah. have this McDonald's. And you know, it's insane. Explain to me what, just for, for some people that don't understand, like what a transfer portal is and how that's changed from when we played to, to what it is now. So there was always a penalty attached to, to transferring, right? Like, so if you're going to transfer and you're going to go from uh, San Jose State to, you know, Fresno State, you would have to sit a year, right? So there was a penalty there, but you could still do it. Um, you know, or whatever you went to Cal to UCLA sure. didn't, you know, that was the penalty. Um, now there's no penalty. And then you also have NIL on top of it. Perfect so you have, storm. it really it's is free agency yeah, and, and NIL is, is what for those that don't so, know. So name, image and likeness, which I think is actually really good. The problem is there's not a lot of parameters for it and it's not built real clean. So before when you were not supposed to be able to pay players or, you know, donors could not engage with players. Now donors can pay a player whatever they want to come to their school. So you have all these things happening at the same time. And the transfer portal, for I would say for some people, it's a good thing, right? They have went to a bad, bad fit, bad situation. bad situation, whatever it is, right? Or you go there and you're a quarterback and John Elway's the starter and you're like, damn. It's over. I'm never going to. That's play. what happened to me as a receiver. Everybody oh, here we go. ahead we of me. We always hear about the <laughs> NFL. And you either play Thanks or you don't. Okay, no, actually, let's use that as an example, right? So I always joke with Wayne. He has one catch in his whole college career. Which, so do I. Which I, has, I had a lot of plays so though. You and I, yeah, 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 one, yeah, okay, yeah, one catch. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. All right. Well, hey, anyway, I'm glad you guys found yeah, some so common you can, ground. You can go on both of us now. Go <laughs> in. Okay, okay, good. I don't yeah. know that I necessarily call that playing college football, but uh, neither here nor there. I think what we were talking about earlier was this idea of. Something goes wrong in college, right? I get recruited. I'm told I'm the greatest. Yeah. Everyone's always told me I'm the greatest. Now I'm yeah. somewhere yep. trying to figure it out. And you're the smaller fish in a bigger pond and things don't go right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's this idea of teaching people that if things aren't going to go right, like this balance of it's not going right. Push on. What do I do? Yeah. Yeah. Or I play behind John Elway. Like I yeah. think they're two really fundamentally different I things. Agree. How I mean, you brought it up a little bit about culture and people, but what does that play? How does that play a role in college and God. even in life and leadership yeah. and coaching? Yeah, that must like, be tough as a coach. You're trying to keep your roster, right? And there's obviously players unhappy. That's a, that, what do you do? I, so uh, that's a, like multifaceted question. Yeah. I'd, I'd say the first thing is we're that, excited. Like, yeah, no, so am I. This is this is a really fun conversation. I, I think first of all, you try and create a culture that is healthy enough in your program where players care about each other, players and coaches care about each other. You're doing the best you can, most right by your players, and whether they play or not is based fundamentally in whether or not they're the best player. Like so, you like you try to make it as clean as it can be and make the environment as healthy as it can be. Now, in terms of what you mentioned, I do think there is something inherently wrong with uh, eliminating the struggle. Like mm. part of the thing, I was not a good player in college, but the struggle of it taught me how to. Sure. Fight through it where actually I got to travel and I got to like get in a game during scrub time and like, like that part of it, that was my path and that's fine. Like that's been eliminated now, right? Like, oh, it's not going my way. I'm out. And I don't think that's necessarily good for young people because I think, you know, we learn and we, you heard some of my Adversity. toughest times. You learn through the hardest moments of your life. Right. You know, that's when you really have a chance to, to overcome and, and find ways to, to move forward. And, and in some ways, I think just jumping isn't the right thing. But there are also instances where it's exactly the right thing for that yeah. kid, whether, you know, sometimes uh, there's a coaching change. Like, hey, I committed to this guy. He left. Yeah. Now there's a new guy. So you have you actually told kids, hey, I, I think it's a good idea, or do they come to you? Or It's, it, it's, it's normally both. You know? Okay. Like, yeah. and, and, wow. um, and I'm going through meetings with our players right now. I'm like, how are you, how you doing here? Yeah. yeah, just trying to have some open and honest conversation because I, you'd rather, I just want to be transparent. You would, and you'd rather right. have the conversation so you know what's going yeah. on, so you know it's not happening, you know, yeah. outside of the building where things could become, you know. Yeah. And I've had that. Corrupt. Like I've had yeah. that. Like I, like when I was at Oregon State, I lost a really good player. Um, he grad transferred. He went and started at Alabama and won a national championship. And he's a good kid, and we, we still talk to this day. But it but because our relationship was strong, he was he didn't tell me what he was doing. Yeah. Right. Like and so there's that yeah. part of it too, and so. Mm. Like, really, at the end of the day, like, everyone has to do what they have to do. At the end of the day, like, we have to build a championship program in San Jose State, yeah. and we have to do it the right way, caring about players, caring about our staff, and and that needs to be good enough. It's fascinating. So you talk about a multifaceted, uh, multifaceted question, but in the grand scope of things, right now the NCAA is getting a little villainized. Right. right. Uh, you have this NIL problem. You have the transfer portal problem. But at the end of the day— 
this college football as a thing, I mean, it, the, the fundamental product is a competitive race to a championship. Right. What you're telling me is that, look, we need to come to a solution because what's going on right now in terms of complete deregulation is not working. And it sounds, for example, what the NCAA did with penalizing a player, for example, for transferring for a year, that led to a little bit of a balance. Are you concerned that the, that the football product as a whole, college football, is being harmed right now and does need to be a little regulated or What's your solution? I, you know, I, I think everybody feels that way a little yeah. bit, and but I think it's a big problem, and I don't think there's an easy solve here. I don't yeah. think there's an, and, and that's what's so complicated. Like I think it's awesome that people can. You know, these kids are 18 years old, right? Yeah. If they were playing pro baseball, they could sign a contract with, sure. you know, hubba bubba bubble gum or whatever. Hubba bubba, wow! Yeah. You remember those? <laughs> they used to pop the bubble, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like whatever that is, and so like I, I think that's a good thing yeah. for young people. I think that's fair. I think it's right, and so. But how, where, how do you balance that? Because a lot of the young people that are getting put in this position also don't have support. They don't understand taxes. They don't understand saving Anything. their money, Credit, investing. Yeah. Like basic yeah, stuff. Well, I mean, we're putting our team through financial literacy right now, the whole team. It's been fantastic. Yeah, and then awesome. just trying to get them to yeah. have an idea, like when they are in that don't space. Don't let Wynn speak at that class. Oh, I majored, uh, I'm, crush that I'm, I majored in religion. That just spiritually comes to me. <laughs> no, it's a really interesting, like yeah, it's a yeah. really challenging time for the NCAA and for college athletics in yeah. general. Um, but I also think it's an opportunity for us to find a way to move forward that makes the game better. Yeah. Like how do we make it better? Like, okay, it's it's messy, right? It's it's always messy when you have a big yeah. change like this, yeah. but how do we move forward yeah. and make it great? Yeah. So let, uh, before we let you go, let's talk a little bit about what you're working on now business-wise and, and personally. Uh, you know, what are... You, you, you had that moment. There's like, there's going to be other moments just like it. How are you uh, working on yourself personally? And then what are you working on some of the things as a coach for, for the future of San Jose State? So for me personally, I feel like when I, when I get like right after the season, I always have like this, uh, I don't know, month or so of like where I'm uh, like I get off, I, get, I go off the rails, like in terms of like I lose my routine like, I don't exercise as much. Like, and then I end up feeling like shit. And then I'm like, oh, my yeah. God, I got to get yeah. that back. Get I'm, back. A, I'm, I'm out of sorts, you know. Um, so that's, you know, I, I do feel like I need that reset. Um, one of the big things I did last year, which has been really cool and it's continued on, is that I started reaching out to coaches that had had a lot of success. It's fast. It's been awesome. Like, I've been fortunate. I've talked to, like, Tom Osborne wow. and, you know, Tara Vanderveer and, like, I've, like, Bill Jackson, like I've been able through our network, connect with all these people. That's awesome. And I've asked them about like sustaining success and how did you do it? And, and what were the, and, and everyone had a different way. And, and that's the other thing that you found out is like, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Yeah. Right? Phil, Phil Jackson was always that five to one way. You were talking about yeah. positivity. Right. He always had that five to one concept of yep. f for fi five positive for one negative. That's right? right. But yeah. it's like right. this idea of learning, right? Yeah. It, like that's using your resources to, yeah. to try to, to try like, and get kinda, better. Kind of like what we're doing, right? Yeah. Like we have elite people on like you and it's like, we, you can always learn something. You glean yeah. something. And it's so funny. We've talked about this. This idea of like we've had maybe twenty people on or talked to twenty people. They've all done really cool stuff in their lives. There's these synergies and like this common overlap, motifs. common yep. things, themes in how they prepare, yeah. things that they've done, and and learning is a big one. Yep. Um, you know, this idea of wanting to get better, this idea of positivity, which is learning and humility, yep. which is what you're expressing, and yeah, and that result and that that manifests through your team, and that's how you win. I, I, I agree. I yeah. agree, and, and and I think also like as an old man now. <laughs> yeah. I, I have an obligation to these young people to try and get them in a headspace where they are willing to try new stuff, where they are willing to continue find ways to learn. Like learning to them is not a real popular subject right now because they feel like they're learning stuff that's not always directly applicable to their lives. And so how do we as leaders of young people give them like the financial Friday thing that we're doing right mm -hmm. now has been so powerful for them because I'm like, hey, th like this is the thing that no matter what you do, sign an NIL deal, go to the NFL, whatever, or start a business, right? Like build an empire. Like you're going to need to know yeah. how to handle this. Well, like, it's a, you know, the big thing like, of, it's not how much money you make. It's how much money you keep. Right. 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 And it's also not just about the, the, the title of the job. It's what you're going to be learning and who you're going to be surrounded yep. by. Yeah. Right. I tell people, look right out of college. We I've talked to San Jose state about this actually in the beyond the football program. And I yeah. said, look, Every single one of you is going to make the same mistake. You're all going to go out and you're all going to look for the highest salary. And that's the biggest mistake you can make. You're right. too young. It doesn't matter. And you, you should only be worried about how you, what you, what your lifestyle just to like live and feed yourself. Yeah. 
those should be the, like, once you get that, then it's about who you're going to be surrounded by. Right. What opportunities are going to come from the opportunity that I take? No like, question. who can I talk to? Who can I learn from? Like, yep. it, it just, in, 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 I wish I could go back and tell myself that type no of doubt. thing. Me too. Me, right? too. Like, Me too. I wish I could tell you now and then, but go ahead. Sorry. No, but you're right on. You're, you're <laughs> no, you're right. right. You're, no, right. you're right on. And I think like between choosing the highest salary and buying the most expensive car yeah. right. at a yeah. young age are like the two worst things that, that they do, you know? And so right. trying to help them have a little bit of a foundation that way as an old older man now, father, husband, uh, you know, that part of it, like helping them look at things like, how do I continue to learn? How do I yeah. continue to grow? And if they're willing to do that, then you guys both know, cause you guys are both really successful dudes. Like, like they'll have a chance to build the life they want to build. Right. But if you're not willing to do those things, you're just going to go back to what you've always known. Yeah. Right? You had this four or five year window. It goes back to what you're saying in full, to coming full circle with, with you and, and, and the practice of good habits. And, yeah. and, and that's a, that can be a learned thing and you have to mm-hmm. force yourself to do that. And once you be, do that, you become virtuous and you win. And that's what I, I mean, that's what I gleaned from this right. session. I think that was, those are great words. And well, that. lastly, I want to give you an opportunity. I want you to sell San Jose state. I want you to sell 2022. <laughs> We're going to cut this up and I'm going to start sending it to, to local recruits down here in San Diego. But, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, I mean, I want to know, like put it all together for us and give us the, you know, the 45 second elevator speech about what okay. you're going to do, why San Jose state and why now? Okay. So th- this is the most exciting time in the history of San Jose state football. We're coming off a three-year consistency of actually playing really good football. We're two years off of the conference championship, which we hadn't won in a long time. We're building a $70 million football facility in our stadium, and we're in this location that's incredible. The sun shines every day. It's an awesome academic institution, and you are close to the beach and the mountains, and you have Silicon Valley in your back door. And, like, I don't think people really understand that, right? Like, when I say in your back door, within 15 miles, you can hit the headquarters of every app that's on your damn phone. Yeah. Right. And so if you have any interest in that, which they all young people do, because that's where they get their information. That's where they live. Their life is lived there. It's not live face to face anymore. And that is where San Jose State is, is in the heart of all that stuff being developed. Right. Uh, Coach, I want to say thank you. This has been awesome. You guys are great. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. So uh, thanks. That wraps up our first episode of uh, of the new season. I don't know what we're going to call it. But but more importantly, it's about really the mindset of why we're here. Whatever you call it doesn't really matter. It's about what you're doing on Fridays and how you're making yourself different and unique and and basically the discipline to do things that others don't on a day that most people, this idea of TGF, and and we just, we have a fundamental like difference in how we see the world when you take Fridays off. So absolutely. And, yep. and, and in context, and, and this is always to, to for our audience, look, season two has begun. You guys are welcome to DM us, sign us. We're on every platform, by the way, Coach. We know okay. YouTube. We know everything. We know TikTok. We know we know the whole deal. But download <laughs> well, us, we, like we, us. We, some of us don't, but others do. That we pay. We uh, pay I just, others I just say we've come full closure. Thank you very much for being on the show. Yep. And that will wrap it up. That's a wrap. And thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Coach. Thank you, guys.